it's time for its episodes with quick tips you should know techniques you can implement into your workflow right here on a tale a tale oh yeah a tale of two hygienists welcome back everyone into this week's tip episode i am your host andrew johnston and thank you so much for joining me today so about i don't know Six to eight months ago, I did a fast facts on the topic that we're going to talk about today. And I know, I don't know, you probably don't want to hear about it again, but it just keeps popping up in the groups where a hygienist is doing a profi, either like on a teenager or maybe like even a super old patient. And it's just a bloody mess and they don't know what to do about it. And so they're, you know, kind of lamenting to everybody in the group about, hey, what do I do? And, you know, it's, it's interesting the response that you hear back about, kind of like how you should handle the situation, how you should code it. Uh, is it okay? Is it not okay? About as much bleeding as there is. It's just, it. I can't believe we're still having this conversation. And so I apologize for the rehashing of this, you know, every six to eight months, but apparently it's a really important topic. So the tips for this week are going to revolve a little bit around kind of that assessment and treatment planning conversation with the patient, how to code it, and maybe some chair side to home care thoughts if we have time for it a little bit later on. I just have a few notes here, so we'll just kind of see how far we get because I'm very verbose all the time when I do this. So first things first is how much bleeding is too much? And well, we have two answers, the scientist in us answer and then the realist answer. The scientist answer is that no amount of bleeding is ever appropriate. Scientists usually are binary thinkers. It's either this or it's that. It cannot be both in the same space. So a little bit of bleeding doesn't really make much sense to them. And in reality, it probably shouldn't make much sense to us either, right? You know those big lists that you see, uh, okay, this is what a hygienist is, and then there's like 30 occupations listed. We're a therapist, we're a mechanic, we're a janitor, et cetera, okay. So I think scientists it should always be on that list as well because we are, we're supposed to be thinking with that part of our brain, that the, the analytical part, the binary part sometimes. Bleeding means that there is something wrong and that something could be because of an accidental injury, but it could also be because of a chronic disease state. If it's the latter, then it's our responsibility to inform the patient of their illness and say, hey, this is a problem. This is how we fix it. Now, we also have the realist, though, in us, right? And I think a lot of us want to think that we're probably, we skew more realist than scientist. But the realist answer says, in our diagnosing, we have a general diagnosis of healthy gingiva, the range of mild to severe gingivitis and the stages of, and grades of periodontitis. And, and I think this is where the ambiguity kind of sets in because in the school we're taught, hey, less than 33% of the mouth is isolated. So we have generalized and then we have isolated. And where we go wrong often is that I don't think that we break down the mouth into sextants or quadrants enough. I think that a lot of the times we're looking at, let's say just like the upper left, and we're like, dang, this is like, we'll say 45% inflamed of the upper left, of the, of the upper left is inflamed and bleeding. There's bone loss, there's pocketing, but you know what? The rest of the mouth is perfect. And so if we did the calculations, it's actually less than 33%. So you know what, patient, you're healthy. Yeah, a little problem area over here, but you know, generally you're pretty healthy. And I think that's where we go wrong. Cause in the past, I mean, it was super easy to be like, okay, it's isolated, no big deal. Let's downplay it. We're going to do a profi. We're going to see how it responds. We're going to have the patient come back. But now, according to the AAP and the overall classification that you're giving for their periodontium, it's based on the worst aspect of the mouth. And so I think that's going to lend a helping hand. So how does that change your conversation with the patient? Before, it was a lot more casual or you know, calm, cool, collected. But now there's a sense of urgency. Like, hey, you've got some issues, patient. And from what I've seen us hygienists have been practicing for a little bit longer and remember those good old days where it's a little bit nicer and easier. But we're the ones that are struggling the most with this shift. The conversation is a little bit harder for us to come by. I mean, I wouldn't say even a little bit. It's, it's a lot harder, I think, for, for us because we, we're so used to one, just we're people pleasers, so we're trying to like make everyone happy, continuing to downplay it with our patients. Like, hey, don't worry about it. It's going to be a little thing. We're going to do all the heavy lifting. Don't worry. Just do whatever you can at home. But man, we got to stop doing that. We got to be the ones to step up and do the right thing. I think the newer classes are taught differently, which is a, a blessing and a curse, I think, for them in in some regards. But I, I think it's, yeah, it's us that have, that have been in this 
this pattern of downplaying for so long that are kind of the problem children on this one. Our conversations with our patients, though, they need to be really meaningful. It's not lecture time. I think this is where we also go wrong quite a bit in addition to like downplaying and, and things like that is I feel like the patients, they seem to have an even shorter fuse, if that's even possible, when they feel like they're being lectured to than before. I mean, you go back 10 years ago and I, and I would have a, le- I would say lecture, but it's a lecture with the patient. And I never really felt like they were this irate or this angry or this quick to be like, dude, by like shutting it, shut, basically shutting down. You can see in their eyes that they just completely shut down. So we need to be better about creating partnerships with them. And so I've talked about this a lot before, but using the perio chart and the x-rays as your objective tools. And one thing that we can do is to be quicker about stating the problem. Lots of us belabor that point because I think that we feel like we need to make sure that they understand that this is a problem. We can't let them take this lightly. And so we just go over and over and over about what a problem this is. And dang, I would challenge the crap out of that, that, that I think the patients just want to know, Hey, here's a problem. Now let's spend a lot of time on that solution. And not even like a lot of time, but just, you know, a lot longer than telling them how terrible they are. They also want to know they're not alone with a problem. And I think we have enough data and stats from either the ADA and the AAP for our para percentage and things like that, that we can normalize treatment that's needed for them without making them feel kind of like, again, like they're the problem children like that, you know, wow, we never see this in our practice. Oh my gosh, you have a, a huge problem. Just, hey, look, you're in the 30th percentile or the 50th percentile. Like you have, you know, half of Americans have this issue. Like you're, you're, you're on track. Trust us that we can get this fixed. I think when I'm talking to our patients, I, I use something that's but maybe not exactly this kind of depends on the patient, but it's, you know, something very similar to like, hey, patient, you heard me talking about these numbers. I ran it by the doctor to make sure that we're on the same page and they agreed that your diagnosis is X. While it's not ideal, lots of people are struggling with this too. We have some great treatment options out there these days to fight it. I have some newer things that you might not have heard about from, you know, yesteryear. Uh, but before I get to these options, what questions do you have about X diagnosis? And that's it. Super quick, super done. You got a problem. Do you have any questions about it? Open-ended question. Let's them make sure that they feel like they're a part of the conversation, that I'm not, again, talking to them without them being part of it, trying to create that partnership. So then with the little bit of bleeding, I'm talking about how do we treatment plan and how do we code it? So first, it starts with an accurate para chart. So a meme I saw earlier in this week, it, it had me chuckling because it was essentially, and if I'm remembering the, the meme right, it was about going to the afterlife and being judged and getting nervous about, you know, the hygienist was being judged, about all the perio charting numbers that they kind of just mailed in without really being super accurate or maybe super honest, or maybe they carried it forward from the last year. I mean, we all know that there are people that are that do that, that are people that are out there doing it. And of course we, you know, we gotta do better about doing that and just spending those few extra minutes collecting the right data. I think it's imperative now for all of you listening that you open your brains now to AI and and voice assisted perio charting. Voice assisted perio charting is not new. It's been around for a really, really long time. And yes, there were, you know, good ones and bad ones and things like that, all ever in the middle. But it's time to it's time to revisit that that conversation with your offices if you're not already doing it. We don't we just don't have the time anymore to do it the old way. We can't have the paper and the pens of different colors and the, you know, the keyboard that has the cover that's covered with a barrier and reaching over. We just don't have time for that anymore. We need to be able to just tell the computer, hey, this is what we're seeing computer, have it accurately record for us. And this absolutely includes bleeding points. One of my duties before was to do chart audits, especially if the insurance company had kicked back a claim. I can't tell you how many times the x-ray supported paratherapy the pocket depths did exactly what they were supposed to do and said, hey, this is going to be, you know, paratherapy. But then there was no bleeding recorded. And so, of course, the insurance company denied the claim. And it's not like you can go back and add the bleeding later because it's now falsifying a record. So they're saying, hey, you guys have achieved stability. You don't need to do this this therapy. But on our end, because we didn't put in the bleeding, we're like, oh, no. So now we're kind of in in dire straits there. So please, please, please remember to record your bleeding. And and even the, the separation. I think recording pus is a huge deal that not enough of us do. A a big thing too, going back to that list of what hygienists are, you know, we got to be detectives. Is the bleeding caused because of pathogens or is there something else going on? I've seen some 
really messed up restorative work before that has caused all sorts of issues. I've seen some areas of abstraction where that gingiva has gotten just a little inflamed and kind of rose up above that margin, creating a pocket that never really seemed to get under control just because of the local irritating factor. I've seen open margins, open contacts, braces, clenching and grinding with or without sleep issues, mouth breathing. Uh, there are so many reasons why bleeding can be occurring. And I'm sorry, but scalers are just not magical instruments. They're not going to fix these problems. So these are different kinds of situations. So we have to be detectives and figure out, is this pathogen based something that we're going to treat that way? Or do we need to treat it with maybe some restorative stuff? And I, something I've heard, and you tell me if you think this is true, but since the pandemic, we as a profession, but specifically the hygiene department, we're issuing less and less home aids than before. And I have lots of theories on why this could be, but I mean, I've even heard about offices not even dispensing toothpaste and toothbrush. I mean, just like the very, very basics. And and they have their reasons for it. Some of them do. But one of the main reasons is the cost of goods have got, has gone up. But also we have less time in our appointments. So we don't have time to demonstrate what a interproximal brush might be able to do or something like that. Uh, a lot of us have moved over to an assisted hygiene schedule where we come in for the actual scaling part, but we're not there for the pre or the post part. So that conversation with homemaids, maybe the assistants don't know about it, or maybe they're just also just slammed and can't get to it. So that part's not being had. Maybe there's office philosophy and policy restrictions that are happening. The newer hygienists maybe just don't know what's available to give for AIDS since they weren't shown or taught with any sort of regularity during those kind of restricted hours during the pandemic for education. There's so many reasons why it could be. But yeah, let me know if you think that's true, because I've heard that multiple times that we're just not educating our patients or giving them the educational aids that we did in the past. I think we really need to get back to interdental cleaners, the gum stimulators, brushes with the appropriate design of the bristle, the texture, all of that. In my old age, I also, it's kind of weird because I think earlier in my career, I didn't really, I was like, hey, let's brush and floss, brush and floss, because even though I was treating these patients, I, I kind of felt like their teeth, whatever I had in my mouth was kind of what they were experiencing as well. And so I couldn't really ever appreciate, I don't think, a water flosser. But now in my old age, I have a little bit of space between these two teeth in the back. I really kind of shifted towards a loving, loving feeling uh, for water flossers. Something I just, again, didn't, didn't care for early in my career. I couldn't even imagine its significance uh, until I've had to use it on myself. And now I'm like, oh, okay, this is great. So Getting back to, I think, some of these basic things that we already know about, but also we need to get back to prescribing restorative treatment and being like the catalyst in our department for the, for the hygiene side of things for the restorative treatment that can fix some of the problems like abfraction, open margins, uh, open contacts, things like that. We need to prescribe the right rinses, the right pace for the patient's needs, prescription for perio trays if they need them. I think everyone should be on some sort of a xylitol spray these days. If you haven't heard of or looked into GBT, which is guided biofilm therapy, you absolutely need to. I really do think this is going to be the standard for every practice in the future. I'm not really sure this is going to be the next 10 or 15 years, but I think down the road, it's it's the best amount of clean that you can get during an appointment. And I think it's super comfortable for the patient other than the uh, the price being an issue because it is an expensive thing for the office to invest in. I think there's not really a reason why we shouldn't be doing this. Anyway, so I've gone on way too long on this episode about like how much bleeding is, is appropriate and some things. But let me just end with this little iteration that bleeding is never okay, right? There are ways to handle it where we can soften the blow a little bit while still being professional and accurate and truthful. And those are the most important things that we need to do as professionals is be accurate and truthful to both the patient and in our record keeping. And also we need to be focusing on solutions, not problems. That's a great philosophy, I think, for all things in life, but very specifically for periodontal issues, uh, especially. So thank you so much for listening. I hope you all have a great weekend and we'll see you next week. A tale of two hygienists.